Napoleon Senki is an odd one. It's our first real-time strategy game. I'm going to be up front here. The controls and systems of the game don't work at all. They're tough to use and easy to break. Nothing quite works the way that you would expect it should. But it also gets full marks for creativity. Napoleon Senki could be translated as the Battles of Napoleon, and it was being localized for the U.S. under a very similar title, though that release was cancelled. The game has the player stepping into the shoes of Napoleon Bonaparte, and you take part in several military campaigns that define Napoleon's career. You have to complete seven scenarios successfully to beat the game. Italy, Egypt, Austerlitz, Spain, Austria, which gets kind of genericized, I guess, the Russian campaign, and Leipzig. There's also Waterloo, but that's a special case. If you're defeated in any of the battles, then you're exiled to Elba, Napoleon escapes, and then you have to win the Battle of Waterloo in order to continue your campaign. That does mean you might have to complete Waterloo multiple times before you beat the whole game. I never did successfully beat the Italian campaign, so that's the only large map we're going to see here. As you start a scenario, you're told how many enemy armies there are, how many of your armies there are, and how many neutral armies are out there. And then you get into the interface, and here's where things get a little bit confusing. Napoleon Senki really is a real-time strategy game. Your units always have a chance to just move. And to give them orders, you have to press the A button to cycle through directions for the cursor. Then move the cursor over your unit, and after a brief moment you'll hear a chime indicating that they've received the order. And that's the direction that they'll go in when they move. How likely they are to move depends on the terrain that they're in. If they're in open plains, they'll move pretty often. If they're in the mountains, then they'll move less often. On the map, if you highlight an army and press select, you'll see the composition of troops. These are randomly distributed, and if you have the default settings, you're probably going to have a lot fewer troops than the opponent does. The white forces that you'll see around on the map are the neutral ones. And if you move an army into them, then some of those forces will be added to yours. There are also these icons that can add a special unit to your army. Cannons are the most important ones, but you can also get some cavalry or some miners. If one of your armies connects with an enemy army, then it's time to battle. First you get a comparison of how many troops you each have, and then you have to choose your deployment formation. The deployment makes a huge difference, but I'm going to save the explanation of that for a few minutes. And then it's to the battlefield, where it plays out exactly like it did in the larger strategic map, only now you have obstructions. The special units are the important ones to understand here. Cannons fire a shot directly in front of them. It explodes a fixed distance away, killing all of the units there. Cavalry charges straight ahead. Cannons and cavalry can only move forward and backward. They cannot turn. And that makes cavalry kind of useless. If there's a rock in front of them, they'll get stuck and can't move. And you can't see any of the terrain until after you've chosen your deployment. To deal with the obstructions, you can have a miner move through them and they destroy things that are in their path. The other important unit is your commander. They start at the back and if they're defeated, then you lose the battle. They can move off the map to order a retreat, which will result in you losing some, but not necessarily all, of your troops. If the army that's being attacked has Napoleon in it, losing Napoleon loses the entire campaign. The thing is, you can take advantage of the vulnerability of that captain. The rest of the units on the map don't matter. You can just keep yours running around, avoiding any enemies, while you swing a group out and around to behind their lines. For this reason, the wing deployment formation is actually the best. I defeated an army four times my size by taking advantage of that. The other thing to watch out for in deployment is where your cannons are. Ideally, you want your cannons to hit the enemy forces, while your troops aren't moving through cannon fire. If something happens and they are lined up, then you have to maneuver around it. 
And that is the biggest problem with Napoleon Senki. Giving commands to formations and getting them to move properly is a real nightmare. Because you could or could not give orders to any unit that you pass the cursor over, you'll find yourself giving unwanted commands a lot. And not everyone will necessarily get your command. That sound that indicates the command has been received can be awfully faint. On top of that, the inconsistent movement of units makes it hard to keep people together. And that means more micromanaging with an interface that's terrible at micromanagement. I'm of two minds with Napoleon Senki. It's not a good game. In fact, it's a bit of a hot mess. I was constantly rushing past the command I wanted to give as I'm rapidly trying to tap through the interface. And the strategy actually doesn't seem to have too much depth. On the other hand, it's an ambitious game that came up with a lot of clever things. Before you start the game, there's an enormous screen of options that lets you tweak virtually everything. Not just AI difficulty, but game speed, weapon effects, how skilled individual units are. It's the most in-depth option screen we've seen so far in a Famicom game. I feel like Napoleon Senki is a game where their reach exceeded their grasp. I like a lot of the concepts in it. I also feel like they're not implemented well. It's a creative game that's about five years ahead of its time. They just weren't able to make it work quite yet. 